Hello, and welcome to The Confident Commit, the podcast for anyone who wants to join the conversation on how to deliver software better and faster. If you're looking to build a toasted chip, tune in less confidently commit. Hey. Oh. You're listening to Season 2, Episode 6. I'm your host, Rob Zuber, CTO of Circle CI. Today, I'm joined by Drew McManus, CEO and co-founder of 33 Teams. And interestingly to me, I think a lot of the conversation will go there, formerly VP of Pivotal Labs. Drew, thanks so much for, for joining me today. Really excited. Hey, Rob. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. So let's let's jump right in. I mean, those those are. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in the evolution between those two things. I know you did a couple mm-hmm. things in between, but mm-hmm. um, a good chunk of your experience has been in um, you know helping teams. Let's say I, I'm going to project a little bit, and then I want to yeah. hear you know your real words. But helping teams get better at being mm-hmm. agile, or even get to being agile. And yeah. so much of being agile is about learning, right? And continuously learning and accepting sort of growth mindset and building on mistakes. Let's just call them mistakes, failures, yeah. you know, things that what didn't go to plan and then and then getting better as a result of that. Big focus of what we're we're talking about uh, this season. So really interested to to get your views from that perspective. But why don't you just give us a little bit of the arc? You know, what what was it that you were doing at Pivotal? I I feel like in my generation, everybody knows what Pivotal Labs is, but maybe not everyone who's listening does. So a little, little bit about just you know what you were doing there, and yeah. and then how that evolved into what you're doing now at Thirty Three Teams. It's funny, you know, I always try to start from a position of assuming people don't know what Pivotal Labs is, and I'm always surprised by the number of people who do. I, I mean, it's mm. it, it's a company that uh, has been around for a really long time and has touched so many teams within uh, within the tech industry. And it has this incredible diaspora of talent. Like, you know, there's a Slack for Pivotal alumni that has uh, like 1,500 people in it. And so uh, it, it's a special place. It's a great place. Mm. Super smart people have gone through there. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's about helping teams get better. And I think uh, a lot of people often mistake it for just like an agile skills thing. Like you go learn how to be agile, which is true. Like that's a key thing about it, but almost more importantly, you learn how to operate as a team. You learn how to interact as people. You learn how to leverage shared values to change the way that you do things. And so in many ways, the um, some of the less obvious or maybe the less tangible things are end up being the most important. Got it. It sounds very in line with, uh, you know, I guess I want to say what we've all learned, but I guess everyone's on a little bit of a different uh, place in that journey, mm-hmm. maybe in yeah. terms of, you know, how to think about operating effectively as a team. So let's let's take the full, you know, leap forward. What, yeah. um, you know, what led you to start 33 teams now or more, more recently? And, and yeah. you know, is is that sort of an offshoot of the things you were trying to do there? Some sure. return to that? Are there some some core pieces that you brought forward? So, you know, I've, I've been in tech and, and really in software for over 30 years at this point. And about half of that time has been in what you might call consulting. And about half of that time has been in product leadership roles. You know, I spent over a decade at Adobe working on products, you know, and and uh, in other companies as well. And so I feel like I'm kind of a product person at heart. And I didn't really discover until I got into consulting kind of almost by accident that it was actually a great place for a product person like me because it's like this playground of, of you get to touch every kind of product that's out there. I mean, I've worked on, you know, consumer apps that I bet you have on your phone. Uh, I've worked on systems for some of the largest financial services companies in the world. I, I mean, at, at Pivotal, we worked on a project that was to help coordinate the refueling of Air Force jets in flight. Like. It, Nowhere else would you get to work on that kind of variety of products. Mm. And so, you know, there's no better place really to, to, for a, a product person to feel like they're in a playground. But I think also, and, and almost more importantly, you know, for me, a person who identifies as a, as a product person, what I've found over the years is that I, what I really love about these jobs 
are the people aspects. Like to me, it's just as much about building teams and diverse teams and, and interesting combinations of different sets of skills and smart people. And, you know, people always ask you like, what, what do you consider a good day? Like, what are the days that you go home and feel like you had a good day? And for me, it's, it's really the ones where I've helped mentor somebody or I've helped somebody get a step closer to their goals or I've helped somebody figure out something that was hard or, or bothering them. And, and so, again, like ha- being able to touch a lot of teams is, is a part of what I, what I think is important. And as you, um, as you work with all these different teams, are there any sort of particular patterns that you've extracted either, you know, th- this feels like a team that I already know just maybe just needs a little bit of a nudge or some new tools. And this is yeah. a team like we're going to spend a lot of time together sort of getting them to a, a new place. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I think um, uh, there was a there was a period of time at Pivotal Labs where I ran every inception and, and an inception is kind of like a kickoff meeting at the beginning of a project. We, and so now that I'm running my own consultancy, I get to I get to do that again. Uh, and there's the overt agenda of the inception, which you can think of as like, what are the goals for this project? What are the non-goals for this project? What are some of the milestones we're going to meet along the way? What are some of the risks? All super important. But for me, there was also always this like more covert agenda of the inception where you're actually looking around at the team And a lot of it is body language. Like you're looking for the person who's like, you know, you got their heels dug in and and the skeptic because you want to draw that person in, right? You're also looking for the people who are kind of like the leaders on the project. And they may or may not be the leaders on the org chart, right? Like, but there are the people on the team who have, I don't know, the credibility or the leadership capital or the respect of others on the team and are able to like, talk to that skeptic and say, you know what, we're just gonna, we're going to try, you know, like, and so Mm -hmm. that is a lot of how you understand how to harness the people on the team, which we all know is what makes up the culture, right? The, the way that these people interact and the way, and the way that they bring shared values to decision-making is culture. And that's really what you're trying to change on, on these kinds of projects. And so, having an eye for that at the beginning of the project can really uh, increase the likelihood of success. I think that's such a, I mean, I'm probably projecting a little bit, feels like such a product mm-hmm. perspective, yeah. like yeah. you're identifying the archetypes or personas, right? Like yeah. the teams are generally going to have the shape. These are the types of roles that are being played here. And I'm going to figure out who's in those roles, but I, I think that's huge. And then being able mm-hmm. to transition that into, you know, I guess, patterns of team dynamics. There's probably Mm -hmm. more than one, but you're identifying at least some common roles that are played in there and then use that to, you know, to build that strength. I'm smirking a little bit as you, uh, as you started, because I've definitely been the arms crossed skeptic uh, (laughs) in in more than one of those uh, exceptions, I guess, just like, what are we going to learn? But I I always get called out really quickly and I'm always (laughs) like, yeah, you're right. No, I, you're right. Well, I'm well, learn something you also mentioned thing. like different kinds of teams and different kinds of challenges. And it's definitely true. I mean, having done thousands of projects over the last 10 years at this point, you start to see, you know, you start to realize like which prescription or prescriptions are required for a, a particular team. And, you know, uh, uh, one that I think comes up a lot is it sort of related to the skeptic is making sure that everyone understands the why, like, why are we doing this? Or why is that important? Or why can't we do it the way we've always done it? it you know, we, we uh, I'm thinking of a, of a recent project in particular where part of what we saw was that the client and, and, and the teams at the client had a real aptitude or an acceptingness or um, an interest in being more agile. And, you know, there had been some kind of grassroots efforts internally who uh, instituted some more process or put new things in place. And it wasn't really getting them where they wanted to go. So they called 33 teams. We went, we we spent months there. And a big part of it was helping them understand the why. You know, we 
We spent a bunch of time at the beginning of the engagement just observing and, and, and trying to understand what they were doing and what was working and what wasn't working. And it was almost like they had like read all the books about Agile or listened to all the podcasts, but they were kind of going through the motions without, it was like an Agile puppet show. Like they would have a retro mm -hmm. and they did it like according to the instructions of how to do a retro, but like they didn't capture action items at the end or actually do anything differently based on what they had learned in the retro. It was like retro check mark, right? Or, or they had planning meetings that they orchestrated using a particular flavor of how you do planning meetings, but they didn't actually come out with a better plan at the end of the meeting. Like it was just like, it is Tuesday, we do planning meetings. And, and so I, I would say a thing that we see a lot at 33 Teams is like, it, it's, it's less about teaching them what Agile is or what the steps involved are, but like, here's why you're doing it. That's when you start to see the light bulbs come on. Yeah, that that's super fast. Uh, I have so many questions. There's so much you covered in there. Oh my goodness. So um, I I'm going to start at the end because that's what I'll remember. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, someone recently was telling me that they were sort of going through this in an organization they were in where, you know, they, they were going to be agile, but it was all about, therefore, we're going to use this tool. Yes. And that will make us agile sort of thing. And I, yeah. I'm a big fan of saying, my, you know, my tool can't fix your culture. Like there's something else here that... Um, yeah. And I ended up sending them a copy of the Agile Manifesto. I was like, mm -hmm. does anyone here mm -hmm. even know what Agile is about? Like, mm -hmm. and you know, we don't have to sit around and tell stories at the campfire, but sometimes it's helpful to just say, yeah. this was what this was the problem we were solving for. Like, does that relate to the problems that you have? And yeah. therefore, these are the kinds of things we're we've done. And these practices, you know, they're implementations that end up being specific maybe to a particular organization. They work there, but you can't just pick up the the practice, you have to pick up the, you know, the goal really. And yeah. then, you know, to your point of why, and then say, okay, well, if we were going to achieve that here in our organization, we might actually do something different, which would mm -hmm. be fine because that's mm -hmm. what would work for us. Well, and, and, and Rob, like, that's a key thing about 33 teams. And it's one of the things that we decided we were going to try to do differently than a lot of the other consultancies that are out there. You can hire a lot of different agile consultancies and, you know, we're all doing similar things. You know, we're all based on the agile manifesto. We all have a lot of, uh, you know, ceremonies and, uh, and elements of agile that we are, are proponents of, and you can get a lot of good work done with all of them. We actually show up and, and, and like I said before, we try to spend a little bit of time observing and understanding like what's the current state of your organization what's the aptitude and the attitude towards changing the way that we work? Uh, what are your business goals? What are your priorities? And then we actually prioritize what agile practices make sense for you based on all those things. What are the things that we can change that have A, the highest business value to your organization, but B, also the highest likelihood of success? So rather than show up with one of the Agile books and say, we're going to do everything in this book and overwhelm you with change. Again, like let's take a recent example, a 33 Teams client. We spent several weeks like digging in with them. And what we ended up realizing was the number one biggest thing they could do that furthered their business goals and actually we thought they could, could learn quickly was test-driven development. They had a lot of concerns about quality. They're a fintech, so it's very important that everything work exactly properly. And you know, they they had a monolith that was aging, and everyone was scared to touch. So great, we brought in our team, and we and we focused on it, we focused on a number of things, but number one was TDD. And you know, it wasn't going to be the end of the world if they didn't change other agile practices that they had in place. Like why, why change everything when we could just change four or five things and get the biggest mm -hmm. impact? Yeah, I think that's, that's really smart. And one of the things I, I mean, we're spending a lot of time these days thinking about learning from, from yeah. failure, or you mm -hmm. I'll call it whatever you want, things that didn't go to plan. And so identifying, Hey, this thing's not working for you. That's, that's important. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what you made me think about in there is like, I love this concept of bright spots, which I picked up from Switch, the, the book Switch and like change management, I'm sure is a big part of what you do. Yeah. And saying, you know, that thing is working like that. You don't have to go do the thing according to the textbook. Like this is working for you. 
let's not change that. And let's yeah. actually celebrate the fact that, you know, you're doing some things that work. You're clearly driving towards some good goals. And we have some ideas around some things that maybe we can try and see yeah. if those things will will work better for you. So I, I'm super curious at, at a high level. Now, I don't know if this is if this is still true at 33 Teams because you're talking about agile consulting. Are you doing any actual uh, like product development work with the teams that you're working yes. with or are you just coaching them on a, a cultural perspective? Yeah, so, you know, I, I was about to say a typical engagement for us, which is funny because we don't really have a typical engagement, but mm -hmm. I would say often for, for bigger companies, the kinds of uh, engagements we do is we show up, we spend the first N weeks actually just digging in. So we will embed a few of our people on teams at the client who will, and we just say, pretend this is a new employee. And so they get onboarded, they start attending meetings and they're, they're observers, they're anthropologists, they're sociologists, they're taking a look at like, how do these teams operate? What are the things that seem to be working? What are the things that don't seem to be working? We're also interacting with the executives to understand like, what do you feel like needs to change? What are your business goals? And we marry all that together. And then at the end of that N weeks, we have a proposal that says, okay, here are the five things that need to change. TDD, number one, um, the role of product management is unclear. I'm making these up, but like, you know, we'll have, a, we'll have a, a set of five things that we say, this is what we think you should do. And here's how we think you should do it. I'm gonna bring a bunch of my people from 33 teams, experts in TDD, an expert in product management. And we're actually gonna take a team and a real piece of your product that needs to get delivered. And we're gonna form a combined team of your people and my people, and we're gonna to work together. And we're gonna work in a new way, not 100% new, but like 15% new. That's gonna make this better. It's gonna transfer these skills to your organization. And, and it's gonna, by the way, deliver working software in the process. Yeah, I, so that that makes a lot of sense to me, and the thing that I'm I'm particularly interested in. I mean, there's obviously a lot of um, either outsourced development shops, or yeah. I don't have a better expression, so I'll call them body shops, like team augmentation. Yeah. Right? I'm just going to yeah. bring in some people, and I think that I, I mean, this is my hypothesis, and I'm probably you know on the same point of bias as you, but that it's difficult. Mm -hmm to deliver software into another organization when there's sort of a, a cultural mismatch. Yes. And it might be one of the things that leads to challenges in those projects. And then if, you know, if I was coming at it from the other side, cause I've done small amounts of consulting, you know, in, in downtime in my career, yeah. I find it really difficult to just write software for people, I guess is what yeah. I'm getting to. Cause I, I say, yeah, I could, but this doesn't seem like it's working very well for you. And this doesn't seem like it's working very well for you. Like, can we talk about the yeah. process and the team structure, whatever, like, yeah. is it, is it actually hard to just be a software development shop because yeah. of those cultural issues? Or is that something that just maybe people like you and me, as, you know, we're more interested in the other parts of it? It's very hard. And, you know, it, you, you try to, uh, it, clients sometimes will try to carve off things that they feel like they can just outsource. And the fact of the matter is, like, if you have something that's less important some way that you think someone else can just do it like why are you doing it at all and so then being the consultant on the outside you're working on the least important thing nobody answers your emails like it's just i don't i'm not a big believer in that kind of approach and mm -hmm. plus you know it's the kind of thing that would be super boring for my team you know what one of the things we've done at, at 33 teams is put together uh, a, a bunch of people who are both talented in their skill, but also senior enough to be coaches or teachers or mentors. And so for them, a lot of the reward on a good day is that they actually had somebody make a breakthrough on a, a, an agile skill, or, you know, there, there's always a point in a project where we've been leading everything, we're running the planning meetings, we're running the retros, but there's a point where we start to ask the client people to take, like, why don't you run the retro this week? Like there are these, moments where you start to see like they're getting it right that's the reward for my people not like oh you know i i i got this piece of code working that's a reward too but it's it's secondary right that, that makes a lot of sense and, and the thing that i guess the phrase that keeps coming to mind for me is sort of leaving you know 
better than you found it almost doesn't mm-hmm. sound significant enough. Like mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. using that as an opportunity, using the project as an opportunity to reset the team a little bit and put them on a better trajectory after you're mm-hmm. gone to not just maintain the thing that you worked on, but to operate as an organization. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really fascinated. Like we, we talk a lot about, you know, changing culture to be able to, to have a growth mindset and learn from your, your mm-hmm. failures. I'm just going to keep saying failure and stop sure. apologizing. And, and so I'm curious what it's like as an outsider, then that, that brings an extra level, I would think of sort of scrutiny. There's trust that has to be built rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talked about the skeptic at the beginning, you know, mm-hmm. for, for these folks who are at the organization to really open up, right? And and sort of say, yeah, this isn't working. I don't know how to do this. Can you help me sort of thing? Like, mm-hmm. A, is that a common pattern? And B, how do you find people, you know, for your organization that are yeah. that are able, you know, skilled software developers, yeah. great agile practitioners, and have the empathy to navigate their way through that kind of situation? Yeah. Boy, there's a lot of questions in there, Rob. So uh, I'll, Sorry, I'll tell you a couple uh, things. I, I think you know, I spent over a decade being part of the leadership team at Pivotal Labs. Fabulous experience, great people, very smart. And then I, I made the decision to, to co-found a new consultancy, 33 teams. And so my co-founder and I, when we were spending time kind of figuring out what we wanted to do, there was a lot of stuff we wanted to bring from Pivotal Labs. I mean, I've got nothing bad to say about Pivotal Labs. Like, it, 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 there's so much good there. But we also wanted to take the luxury of having a blank page and, and do a few things differently. And, and so one was embracing remote, like starting mm. from remote first. And that, as you know, Rob, opens up a whole new uh, hiring opportunity. The second was we wanted to make sure that we built a very diverse team for all the reasons that diverse teams are better. And and so being the product person that I am, I couldn't help myself. I actually embarked on some user research. And so I mentioned earlier, there's this big diaspora of Pivotal alumni out there. I went and talked to a bunch of people who had been at Pivotal to understand, like, what did they like about it? What did they not like about it? What would they have changed? And so... That led to how we defined our values, how we defined our process, how we defined our offering. Uh, And and I'm happy to report that at least so far, it's going great. You know, we've attracted a lot of people who are very senior, uh, have experience running teams, but for whatever reason have decided that they'd rather help consulting. They'd rather help other teams get better. And a lot of their reward comes from that. And so... We're getting better and better at recognizing those kinds of practitioners, you know, product managers, product designers, uh, software engineers, and, and and we've put them together in the, into this uh, a team a team that inspires me every day. Well, that's that's awesome. Uh, I love the. I mean, I, I love the access, right? I think those those mm-hmm. um, alumni networks. I mean, mm-hmm. Not just pivotal, but I mean the common yeah. across consultancies yeah. and other orgs are always fascinating and rich sources of uh, of information that we we forget about sometimes. Um, and gl- glad to hear that you're able to get you know folks that uh, that really do that well. So okay, I have one quick question before we transition to the kind of the wrapping part. Sure. What's the what's the thirty three? <laughs> You know, I wish there was a really great story. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, I'm sorry and, to expose you. No, that's quite all right. And it's funny because uh, we get asked the question a lot, like, why is, why is the 33 teams? And, uh, and I always end up telling people, you know, it's actually not that interesting. Like, uh, we liked the alliteration of it. The dot-com was available. I previously had a consulting company called Rogue 3 that got acquired by Pivotal Labs, which is how I ended up there. So it's a little bit of a callback to that. Uh, but what's interesting is that people always go, oh, that's not that interesting. I thought you were going to say, and then they have a much better story. And it's like, I feel like maybe I should just steal one of those and have a fictionalized version. <laughs> like, you know, maybe you've run 33 teams in the past. And it's like, I think it's actually a lot more than that. 
<laughs> that yeah exactly well yeah you could totally do that by the way yeah. i think um yeah writing the the founding story is often a revisionist project so yeah uh, i, I think at some point we'll have to fictionalize it. the 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 origin That's story right. somehow uh, it's always in the details. Just have some really <laughs> intriguing details, and everyone yeah. will believe it from here on out. And we, you know, let me know. We'll edit this yeah, we'll have to podcast. It'll be <laughs> <laughs> perfect. All right. Well, so the the way that we love to uh, to wrap this up again, we're we're exploring kind of uh, learning from from things that have felt catastrophic. So we have this segment, the Red Build Rewind. Can you tell me about a time uh, that you went through something that felt you know, catastrophic as a failure in the moment, mm -hmm. but uh, ultimately ended up being something that you maybe learned from, maybe carried forward in your career, and you know, yeah. maybe is one of your better stories that you tell people about. More interesting yeah. than uh, than maybe. yeah, yeah. I think you know, and I think especially uh, right now, but I think often in our industry, there's change going on. There's a lot of change, right? People go through reorganizations at bigger companies or maybe through layoffs or you get acquired. I mean, I, I've, I've been in the industry long enough to have been through all of the above. Like I've been the acquirer, I've been the acquiree, I've been reorged, I've, you know, and, and in a lot of those situations, I used to often use this uh, quote from, uh, I think it's Robert F. Kennedy, and it's, this is completely paraphrased, but basically what he says is, everybody's for progress. But progress means change, and not everybody is for change. And I think, you know, that's a great sentiment. But I think the, I think to be honest, a core, a, a, a something that follows from it is, progress means change, but change doesn't always mean progress. And you might find yourself in a situation where change leaves you miserable. And for me, you know, it was often finding myself working for somebody who. I didn't share values with, or who had a different idea of the culture than I did. And, and you know, I'm a big believer in values-based leadership and I have very well-defined values around people. And we've talked about some of that today. And so when there's a mismatch, it can be hard. And so the lesson for me, and I, learned, I was fortunate enough to learn this early in my career, and I've had to relearn it a few times, is the people that I work with is actually more important than what I am doing. That for me personally. And so mm -hmm. I, I think there are a lot of people who feel that way. And I think that it, it's just, it, it's an epiphany when you realize like, I would rather work for that person, even if it means taking a little bit of a left turn on my resume, take the left turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love it. I, you know, I don't know if it'll ever come up, but you're reminding me of a, of a story that I've told only a few times about some fairly catastrophic moments in my life. And I think the takeaway was basically the same, like yeah. this all went sideways. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was around in the dot, in the original dot com collapse, right? Yep, I remember and, it well. uh, Yeah, I think everybody yeah. that was there <laughs> yeah. has some has some fond memories, right? And they, over mm -hmm. the course of time, uh, I think they've turned into great stories. Uh, so that's totally fine. But, you know, the people that I worked with all the way back then were still really, really good friends. We call each other for advice. We talk about what we're, you know, what we're doing. We also just talk about whatever, because we've, you know, that connection, honestly, particularly working with someone mm -hmm. through those catastrophic moments is often like a, a really interesting bond, right? You have something yeah. that you've shared, like a tough experience yeah. that you've been through together. So, um, and if you're going to go through those tough experiences, be doing it with people Mm -hmm. you know, that you really share values with and enjoy working with. Um, yeah, I love that as a, as a takeaway. That's mm -hmm. so great. Awesome. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks again for joining me. I mean, so I, I could talk for hours. That's, that's the challenge of this. I, I mean, I, I love doing this. I learn so much every time I, uh, I talk to someone. So mm -hmm. appreciate all the insights. Um, super excited for all your successes uh, at 33 teams. And I hope that continues to grow. I, you know, I think you're doing very important work, let's say, because teams that get better, everyone feels better, enjoys it, you know, that much more. Thanks everyone for tuning in today. If you enjoyed the podcast, you know, subscribe, share it with your friends, all those things. If there's someone you want us to talk to, something you want us to talk about, find us on Twitter at CircleCI. Drew, again, thanks so much for joining today. Uh, thanks, so Rob. much amazing insight. Great to be awesome. here. Awesome.